Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter to everybody that celebrates it, of course, but happy Easter. Um, we are going to talk about the Illinois Final Line I Elite Eight game, <laughs> the beat down, curb stomp, whatever you want to call it, loss to UConn, uh, 77 to 52. And at some points, it wasn't even that close in the second half. So uh, we're going to break it down, talk about it. What's next for the Illini? Um, talk about different topics. Of course, the Brad Underwood stuff came up again. Um, you know, the game happened last night. Got to sleep on it. Thank God, because if I were to do a live reaction, it probably would not have been pretty. Um, but we're going to discuss the game. Uh, but yeah, so make sure that if you're watching it live or live on YouTube, uh, live on X and live uh, on Facebook. So like and subscribe to YouTube channel if you can. So if you're watching it on X, please just for a quick second, I posted the link. Click on the YouTube link, hit the subscribe button and the like button just very quickly. It takes like six seconds. Uh, if you could do that for me, I appreciate it. I think you can like it on X too. So if you can, if you're watching it, I can see. Uh, make sure you like it on X too. If you can do that for me, it really helps and share it. Um, regardless if you agree with me or not, uh, hit the like, share it, please. If you're watching it, um, goes a great way. <sighs> so, a line I lose seventy-seven to fifty-two in the Elite Eight game. Versus UConn, the number one seed, the reigning national champions, uh, brings UConn's record to thirty-five and three. <sighs> what a tough, tough second half! Tough second half for the Illini. Um, <sighs> let's talk about the game. First half, I thought was a very competitive basketball game, right? Um, what hurt the Illini was the layups, missing layups. They normally, like, we're used to seeing them take these open threes a lot. And sometimes they just fall in love with them and then they forget about the rest of the game. They literally forgot about shooting threes. There was a lot of times where, like, Quincy and, and company, they would have an open three and they would not take it at all. And you're sitting there going, okay, the one time you probably need to, you need to. Um, clinging down low was causing a lot of issues with blocking. And, you know, blocking the shot. They were really crowding up the paint. Uh, Terrence Shannon did not play well, but he also was not getting the ball a lot, which was weird. Um and anytime there was a fast break opportunity, they I couldn't tell. I would have to rewatch the whole game if UConn was really taking him away from the fast break because you saw kind of two different game plans here. The game plan from Iowa State was, okay, we have to be okay with what Terrence Shannon Jr. does. But when Domask is scoring 15 to... 30 points, not 30 points, but he scores like 25 because he's posting up, backing down. It causes a lot of issues. And so let's take that part of the game away. Let's frustrate a couple things that they want to do, trap it, throw it out. UConn basically said, do, you know, okay, don't mask. You do what you do. Can we take Terrence? They actually, somebody finally kind of said, okay, can we take Terrence Shannon out. So let's, you guys, ever, you know, if you guys watched the documentary on Michael Jordan, there was almost like a Michael Jordan rule where it said, okay, every time he gets the ball, drives to the lane, we're going to be physical. We're going to see how the refs call it. And I'm going to get to the refs here in a second. They drive to the lane and we're going to be physical with them. Let's try to block every single shot. We have depth. UConn has a lot of depth. So a lot of this game planning doesn't matter because they can rotate guys through. And they were going to say, okay, we're going to be just as physical as we possibly can. We're going to block shots. We get fouled. We get fouled. And Taryn Shannon is not going to take over this game. Domas can do what he does uh, because we got to 
see if he's going to miss shots. We got to be okay with him making some shots. Um, and that was kind of the game plan the entire game, but especially the first half. The first half, Illinois was matching physicality. Bang, 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 right? On defense. Defensively, they were being very physical again, just like we saw against Iowa State. So you felt pretty good about that. Illinois was missing some layups, some dunks. Uh, they were hit it, missing some shots. Like no team was shooting well. So the first half, this is for both teams. They were all missing some shots. There were some wild shots being thrown up. So the first half, you know, it was finally tied at 23-23. Going into halftime, it was 28-23. They were in that danger zone of, okay, this is what UConn does sometimes. They are a, Illinois is good at fast break. So is UConn. But you, as an Illini fan, I'm sitting there going, okay, we're in that danger zone, but the defense is playing tough. We're just not taking the traditional, like, we have to reset ourselves. We have to get back to doing what we do and taking some of those shots. I, I, you know, I'm going to try to stay on topic here. Um, the, the, the game plan, even Brad Underwood said it was, if Clean gets 10 blocks, he gets 10 blocks. Like, we have to continue to drive to the lane. We have to try to get some of those mid-range shots. We have to try to – basically, in my opinion, what they wanted to do was just, just – you have to be able to attack the rim. You can't 100% stop driving to the lane no matter who's in the middle because that's part of Illinois' game is that they can drive and kick and do those things. You can't take that part away. And you can't just become a three-point overall shooting team, especially if that's not 100% what you do because it, you're, you're not going to do it well. Case in point, in the second half, they continued to drive to the lane. They were getting blocked, missing shots. UConn got on fast break and got quick buckets, right? So that turned into us just not one, not being as physical on defense. But then what started to happen again later on was they finally started to shoot threes, but then they were getting missing them, getting the long rebounds. UConn was gone, right? And Klingon was just a big matchup problem. He's very they're very good at passing. UConn was very good at passing into the lane and getting those layups, getting those dunks, getting those extra shots. You can't take that away from them. And it just kind of you didn't expect. Illinois to lose in this fashion. I mean, UConn went on a, you know, in the second half, UConn went on a 30 to nothing run. Like, that's very embarrassing. And I know the players are embarrassed. And I know Brett Underwood's embarrassed. Now, in turn, UConn is very good, right? Like, they're not the best college basketball team we've ever seen. They're just very confident in what they do. They're very quick. We talk about Illinois is a quick, fast pace. Alabama is a very quick, fast pace. UConn proved that last night, that they are a very quick, up-and-down team. They can pass very well. And whew, they started to hit shots. They started to get some and ones um, on defense, blocking shots. We were missing shots. We started to stand around a lot more. We were not making extra passes. Um, then what started to happen, what starts to happen is you drive to the lane and you get blocked a lot. You are going to start doing these weird little floater things and they're just not, sometimes they're a good shot. Sometimes they're not, especially if they're like, I, we practice them, you know, I coach basketball, we practice them. Um, our head coach believes in a lot of those type of fundamentals. And so we practice them, but that's just like a last case scenario. And, you know, it just doesn't look good all the time. And we couldn't hit a shot. They just hit all the shots and then 30 nothing run. And at that point, you're like, okay, well, there it is. And, you know, going to try to again stay on point here. Um, repeating, if you're watching on X, which people are, uh, please like it on X, retweet it, or re-X it, I guess. Real quick, if you are on X, could you also click on the YouTube link that's on there and subscribe to the YouTube channel? That 
grows more than X, I think, but we'll see. Um, so on X, you know, tweeting a lot about the game, um, a lot of good points were made about, you know, should we adjust the game plan? You got a seven foot, seven foot two guy down there. Should we start to stop driving to the lane and everything? And I said yes and no. I think we have to start driving and kicking more. But I also said this. And as a coach, you hate to do this part, but I'm going to. <laughs> Those refs for the game were God awful. The refs were God awful, right? Uh, <laughs> I understand letting a team play physical. I understand allowing some things to go, which I appreciate. Like you don't want to call every single ticky tack foul. But what I also hate is when you feel like you've got three refs calling three different games and that's the worst part when you're a coach and a team trying to figure out what exactly they're doing. And this is why I was okay at first with the whole continue to drive to the lane thing because Illinois was getting fouled a lot. Klingon should have had way more fouls. Other players, like, I understand that a defender has the right to the position and stand there. But you also can't displace the offensive player. That that's what it comes down to. You know, when an offensive player deplaces a defensive player, that's where charges come in, right? That's why they fall over because you're displacing them, right? Now, sometimes you know it's a block because we've become more of an offensive game, NBA, college. But it wasn't just once, twice, three times. Illinois just continued to drive to the lane because they were trying to get them in foul trouble, which I said in the when I was talking about uh, the pregame on my episode where I said, is Terrence Shannon Jr. considered one of the best Illinois players? I said, like, they got to get in foul trouble, and the only way you do that is driving to the lane, right? Now, maybe they should adjust and drive to the lane and start taking some twos, you know, little short jumpers. And when you're getting down 30 to nothing run, you have to turn into a uh, jump shooting team. But I wasn't uh, completely upset with that game plan to continue to drive. Because I guarantee the way I thought watching the game, Illinois was getting fouled and they're thinking, because I tell my players, drive to the lane, drive to the lane, and then they'll come over and tell me, coach, you're not calling the foul. And I have to tell them, it is a foul. You have to just continue to be tough. The moment you stop being tough, they're definitely not going to call it. You have to continue to drive to the lane, and eventually they're going to start calling fouls. And I can't say this is exactly what Brad Underwood was thinking because obviously we're not down there talking. You know, he's way smarter than all of us. But I have to think that they felt like those were fouls, and so they wanted to really – adjust it and say, okay, continue driving the lane. They're going to start calling these fouls. We're going to get to the free throw line. They're going to have to back off their aggressiveness, right? And this is how we're going to do this, right? Now, and then then the, uh, getting back to the refs calling three different games, then all of a sudden it would be Illinois does exactly the same thing that UConn did, but it'd be a foul, right? And now I know I'm just sticking up for Illinois. There were times Illinois fouled UConn and they didn't call it. Right. So then I had to be okay with it a little bit. But I, it, for both sides, like you, it's tough on players because they're trying to figure out how you're calling the game, how they can play. Right. And just all that type of stuff. And so I thought the refs were awful. They wanted to make sure that we knew they were there in certain moments. They were calling three different styles of games, which to me, is horrible for a coach and it's horrible for a play, uh, horrible for a player because how are they supposed to know how you're calling it? And it's horrible for a coach because how can you tell the player, okay, this is how we teach you. This is how we do things like this. Well, the ref's saying this, you adjust, but then it continue. Like it's just, it's a snowball, right? And, you know, I can make it not trying to make excuses, but like as a fan too, like you're watching it 
and coaching for 14 years, you're like, okay, this sucks. Now, if that's happening, then yes, you need to adjust. Illinois started to adjust, but by the time they had time to adjust, it became this up and down game that UConn was making everything. Everything started to go and they went on 30 to nothing run. Our defense slacked off. And so if you're trying to make these adjustments, you can't give up on, you know, the style of defense you want to play and being physical. And so um, that's just kind of what happened with them. And so the, the, the refs wanted to make sure we knew they were there. Um, <laughs> Kling and I love how he thinks he's super tough. Like he Coleman blocked his shot and they called a foul, which I didn't like because he hit the ball first and then touched the arm. And he turned around and was like talking to Coleman Hawkins. And I know Coleman Hawkins probably chirps at him a little bit, but he acts real tough. He's not tough. <laughs> I, I, I never he acted like he was really tough. And I hate when people act really tough and then somebody holds them back, then they act tougher. Like that part really bothers me. Like he He's not tough, and I don't understand it. He's a very cocky person. And I know people are like, oh, look, look, you got Coleman Hawkins, very cocky. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that, but I'm just venting here that they have that. And then the head coach, Hurley, my God, like obviously a good coach, won the national title last year. That guy complained about everything. He was on, on, it looked like he went to go double team uh, Terrence or don't ask whoever had the ball. Like the video that Barstool sent out, like it looked like he was about to come out there. Like I know he's passionate and I know he does all that, but man, he complained about every single thing that the refs would call on him or the way they would point and everything else. Just a big complainer. And then at the end of the game, he wanted to be like, well, I had extra fuel to my fire. Uh, you know, Sean Harrington used to play for Illinois, tweeted something about they never seen a team like Illinois and he wanted to defend the Big East and everything else. Like, that's what you needed to get better. Like, not the fact that you, I don't know. It, like, it, great coach, obviously. He has a very uh, slappable face, I guess. I don't know. Just, I don't know. He looks crazy. He <laughs> complained about everything, like absolutely any call that was made. And I'm like, are you not watching your team just absolutely throw Illinois into the ground and no foul is called? But you want to complain about absolutely everything that there is? Like, come on, man. Then you want to talk about an Illinois player from years and years ago that – Somebody had to show you like his tweet and then just like, we're going to add fuel to this fire because this guy that used to play at Illinois is talking about Illinois and talking about us and everything else. Stop it. Just, just stop it. Um, then we got to address this again. And we've, I, I think I have to say this every single time I talk about Illinois on here, people had the audacity to say, fire Brad Underwood again. In the second half, they said, this is horrible game planning. We need to fire him right now. After the game saying, okay, he can't win the big one, fire him. And I'm sick and tired of talking about it. Okay. I'm sick and tired about I'm sick of it because he has three big 10 titles, whether it's the regular season and the regular season. He's gotten the team. He has more. The team with him, with Brad Underwood as coach, has more Big Ten wins than anybody since 2020. He has now gotten the team to the Elite Eight. They make the tournament uh, the past three years in a row. COVID, they would have made it again. Like, they were on pace to make the tournament, and COVID happened, so there was none. So, you know, to me, you're looking at that. Um He's coached all Americans. He's gotten guys to the NBA. They're put on the map. Why do we say fire him? Because another team that's really good executes their game plan better. I know it falls on him, but like, who would you hire if you wanted to fire him? It makes no sense. Who are you going to hire? Who's going to be just as good? 
I'm waiting. Please, somebody let me know. Who would you hire over him if you decide to fire him? That's what I thought. Nobody. Nobody. You wouldn't hire anybody like that. A guy that rebuilt the program when he got hired up until what it is now. He adjusted. You know, he recruited. And then looking the last, especially this year, he, well, last year he got Terrence Shannon in the transfer portal, right? Got Domask in the transfer portal. He got Gary Air and uh, Quincy, uh, Gary Air and the transfer portal. Like, he's now understanding how the transfer portal works. He's going to accept it because if you don't accept it, you get left behind. So, I mean, stop with the firing. Now, I know most of it on Twitter is non Illini fans. I know some of it is bandwagoners, probably, or it's just people out there trying to stir the pot with people, which I understand. I stirred the pot, whatever. But just stop. Just stop with the fire Brett Underwood talk. And he even said it in his press conference where he said, you know, shame on you if you don't think Illinois is back on the map and become an elite program because that's where it is right now. Now the challenge is going to be, now you've gone to Elite Eight, how do you battle to get back to at least Sweet 16, right? Like that's going to become that. But if that's the standard, that's what they're going to look at, right? And he's going to continue to coach the way he does. Uh, they're, he's going to try to recruit the way he was, but also dip into that transfer portal. He already talked about how he's looking at guys, talking to people already. And so stop with the Brett Underwood firing. It doesn't make sense. Stay in your lane. Stop watching one or two Illinois games and then saying you're going to fire Brett Underwood. You need to watch the whole season, see how he conducts himself, how he coaches, and where he's gotten Illinois. Like, remember where we were. The tail end years of Bruce Weber the John Gross era, you know, there were some up and downs there, but we weren't getting into the tournament. Then Brett Underwood comes along, has to rebuild it, recruit some guys, transfer portal world becomes a thing, still tries to do it, adjusts, and then get some guys, able to coach them. Guys maybe went to the NBA, were going to go to the NBA, decided to come back and play for him, not a different team. So he's able to keep some guys. He has guys on the roster now for next year that – are looking to be big players because we are losing Terrence Chan Jr. Looks like we're going to lose Coleman Hawkins. He has his COVID year he could use, uh, but he might decide just to either be done playing basketball or he's going to go on and NBA or overseas. Quincy was a, only had one year left. He'll be gone. Don't mask, gone. Um, those are some big-time people that we've got to replace. And there's some guys on the bench there that you could use. Uh, there's guys that are in the portal right now. I know he mentioned that he's talking to already to try to get in there. And because of the Aotusumu who's building up the program, be, because of these guys getting to the Elite Eight, hopefully that, that does help recruiting and it helps transfer portal saying, I want to go play for this guy. The high praise that he gets from his other players helps in recruiting and the transfer portal. Um, I, I do want to say that I didn't know that because I paid more attention to transfer portal world and football because I think so many more enter. I'd have to look. It just feels like so many more enter in college football transfer portal than anything else. He said last night, Brad Underwood said that he doesn't like how the transfer portal is open during the NCAA tournament because he's like, I'm on the phone with recruits already. His assistants are looking in the transfer portal and they're trying to game plan and get ready for their Elite Eight game. How is that okay? Like NCAA, you have got to get your shit together. We need leadership, and there is no leadership. Like, how is that okay that your transfer portal window can be open during the NCAA tournament? Wait till after the championship and then say, okay, now you can make this decision. Like, how dumb is that? Because... Well, I know most teams aren't playing, so maybe that's what you're thinking about. But what about the ones that are? Like now you're adding extra pressure onto them if they know they need to replace some guys that are only in their last year. Like, come on. Like NCAA, you gotta start using some common sense. Like, I'm okay with name, image, and likeness. I know there might need to be a cap on the money that's made, which may be fair, not fair. I don't know. I really I mean, as long as they're making money to live on and if they get a full scholarship. And they get this money and they're able to live. I, I I want them to make money. So to me, maybe that's not quite the issue. The issue is when they can transfer as many times as they want and you're allowing it to happen. 
you should only allow one free one to go wherever you want. Once you sign the scholarship, you are stuck there unless you do it the one free time. If your head football coach leaves and you get an extra one, but you have like a 30-day window to make that decision if you want to jump in or not while still having that free one. So maybe you see it do happen twice, right? Or is it that wherever collective and somebody has to say, okay, if a person comes here and they sign something that says they're going to make this money, they have to stay at school for two or three years, maybe not four years, but maybe they say, okay, you got to be here for two years or you're not getting, and you're only going to get this amount of money if you stay for two years. If you stay for three years, you get this amount of money. Like just something like that has to happen. I don't know how they go about doing that, but this whole jumping in whenever they want, having this window open, like NCAA, you need some leadership. You need to put on real big boy pants, put on the belt and really get in there and like have some leadership. So that way these players just is not a free for all at times so that these coaches know that you're backing them and because it's a lot of pressure and it just has more structure right now. If it's just willy nilly, do whatever you want. It's double is just laughing at everything saying you wanted players to be paid and this is what it looks like. No, stop doing that. They want to make money because of their name. Like the rest of us do good. I always joke with coaches that I have on the show. If a kid wants to go on Twitch and become a professional gamer on the side that he plays football and he gets sponsorships because he's on Twitch and making money, allow him to do that. Really don't care. They want to make a YouTube channel to use their name, image, and likeness and make money. I do not care. If a car dealership calls and says, hey, I want you to be in my commercial and then come sign autographs, who cares? Who cares? That's them. It's not the school doing that. The school's given the scholarship part. But that's to fulfill their athletic part of it. If they want to do the extra stuff, who cares? But it's when other name, image, and likeness collectives can offer money to people, not the coaches, and get them to go in the portal because the portal can be whatever. And NCAA doesn't deny all the time. They just let it go because they want everybody to look at this Wild West. Just be a leader that we look for, like we look for in our politicians, which we don't have either. Like in Illinois, we don't have leadership. In the United States, it seems like we don't have it. Like it's just a weird time to live. Leadership, 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 leadership. That's my rant. Um, but thank you to the Illini fans that, or to the players like Terrence Shannon Jr., Domas, Coleman Hawkins, Quincy, like all these guys. They had an incredible season. They got to Elite Day. We cannot be mad. Yes, it was a bad game to way to lose, but you know what? You lost the number one seed, reigning national champion, might be on pace to win the national championship again. They have good players. You made it to Elite Eight. Can't be mad about it. Um, you know, they this team won a Big Ten title. You know, a couple of years ago, they won a Big Ten title, so they're always going to compete for some Big Ten title, whether it's regular season, anything else. Brett Underwood has more Big Ten wins. Illinois has more Big Ten wins than any other Big Ten team since 2020. Oh, and they haven't lost to Michigan yet, so let's put that on there. Um, so it was a great season. It's a fun season to watch. We'll keep track of recruiting and all that stuff of who they get because they got a lot to replace, everything else. Um, so it was a fun season there. Um, thank anybody for watching or listening. Real quick, if you're watching on X, hit the heart, retweet it real quick. It takes you less than two seconds. Um, then if you've got an extra seven seconds, Go to YouTube, subscribe. Just do that for me. It would help out a lot. Um, but thank you guys for watching and or listening. Check out, you know, like and subscribe to the YouTube channel, Coach underscore Steve72 on X, the Coach Steve Show on X, TikTok, the co um, TikTok Coach Steve72 stuff there, Instagram, Coach Steve72, the Coach Steve Show, Instagram, Facebook group, a lot, lot going on. Um, and check out all the other episodes on YouTube. Lots of talks. If you want to really talk about recruiting the transfer portal, watch the episodes I have with college coaches because that's a big topic we talk about all the time. Um, so thank you guys for watching and or listening. I'll see you guys next time.